I want to talk to you, I want to introduce Lisa Rost. So Lisa loves to design data visualizations. She is currently the Knight Mozilla Open News Fellow at National Public Radio in Washington, DC. If any of you guys do not know NPR, let me tell you, it was the number one thing I personally missed in the decade from 99 to 2011 that I lived in Germany. I'm almost as much as I miss Cory Vorst in the States now. I, no seriously, it's amazing, it's way better than public radio here. You have way better public TV than we do, but we have way better public radio. So if you have an opportunity, check out NPR.org and look for shows like Radio Lab, All Things Considered, Fresh Air. But anyway, enough about Lisa's... Absolutely. Any, any other suggestions from the audience? <laughs> Absolutely. Morning edition. I mean, I'm in New York City, so Brian Lehrer, lots of different options. But anyway, enough about Lisa's workplace. Lisa creates visualizations I'm for NPR now, but previously when in Berlin, she designed for and with the open data city Spiegel und Tagesspiegel, taught data visualization at universities, and also or organized the DataViz meetup. This is one of the talks I was looking forward to seeing, and so it's really kind of a privilege for me to be able to uh, introduce Lisa, but I'm not the one here to see. So Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, thanks for having me and thanks for the introduction. I'm not sure if you got everything. I think what you need to know about me is that I take numbers, and I put them into something like that. Um, and I've done it for a long time now, and I really like it. Um, and data visualization is definitely hyped. Like the, inc like the demand increased over the last five or 10 years. Everybody wants to do it now. Um, but only recently, uh, we started thinking about if these facts and figures um, that are visualized here actually matter. Um, so that's what we did, especially this year, right? Like this year. Uh, we found out as a society, especially in the US, that some people take feelings and perceive them as a truth. So today I want to ask the question, can we take truth and make it evoke feelings? Can we take data points and make people care about them? Especially data points that can walk into a bar, um, meaning humans. And I want to um, ask this question with three questions. Uh, first, uh, in the first part, I want to talk about why feelings are good and why feelings are bad and why we can't have them and why we should have them. In the second part, I slow, um, shortly talk about what it all has to do with data visualization. In the third part, I want to bring um, specific examples. So feelings. Um, we all have these blurry things that sometimes come to us and then sometimes they leave. Um, these are some, only some of them, it's like right now, for example, I'm pretty happy to be here. I'm also grateful for being here. And I also have like a um, small version of fear, which is nervousness. Actually, that's a huge part right now. Um, <laughs> but there are two feelings here that are a little bit separated, and these are empathy and compassion. Because empathy and compassion, uh, we direct towards somebody else, and they can have as a content everything that's in this list. Um, so let's define some terms here. Let's make some distinctions. Distinguishments. Empathy um, is when we feel the feeling somebody else has. We put ourselves in their shoes. If you would have empathy with me right now, you would also feel nervous. Um, and compassion is uh, more like sympathy. Like if you would have compassion with me, um, you would not be nervous. You wouldn't have these negative feelings. Um, but you feel would feel more like positive feelings, like love or sympathy for me. Um, and almost everybody on this planet can agree that having empathy and compassion is better than not having empathy and compassion. A quick Google search found that smart people on the internet think that empathy is the only way we will survive war. <laughs> that empathy makes for good people, and good people make for good societies. And Obama is a big fan of empathy, saying empathy makes it um, harder not to act, harder not to help. So empathy is something that comes in all of us. We, we are really good at that. We're really good at directing our empathy to one of us. Like, for example, this child that most of you already know um, was on a shore in 2015 in Turkey. Um, but we have some troubles directing our empathy at two people. Imagine I would have bought my beloved clone and she would have given a talk to here at the stage, slightly similar, but also slightly different. It would be hard for you to 
direct your attention towards me and towards her talk at the same time. And it would be really hard if all of us would be at that stage except you, and you would listen to all of us giving a talk. Um, I'm not sure if you would get anything out of that talk. Um, and it would be super hard to direct your attention. And that's the same with empathy. We have, we're really good at directing empathy to one person, but we're really, really bad at directing it to lots of people. That's why we can have empathy with this one kid, but not with the 3,770 other people um, who also died crossing the Mediterranean Sea in 2015. And I mean, that scales up. That's not something that you feel, and it's like a little bit blurry, etc. But this photo of that kid, it actually led to huge donations to the Red Cross. And it also changed politics. Um, the Guardian wrote that European leaders have been shocked into forming more compassionate policies by previously hostile media outlets took a more conciliatory tone. And look at the wording here, shocked into. The emotions were the reason for that. It almost feels like they were forced to have to have these, um, to, yeah, to have these um, implications thanks to the emotions. That's um, the conclusion to draw here. Our lives are actually not all worth the same value. We value lives more if it's only like one or two or three. And it's like the more lives there are, the harder to process and we don't really have much empathy for them left. Um, that's that's pretty sad. I mean, yeah, it's it's really easy for us to have like this one person and to have empathy for that, but we can't multiply it with 3,770. Um, that's why I concluded that emotions suck. Um, feelings are the worst. Um, okay, it's not the worst, but they're not really articulate. Um, like, they are good and bad. You have one candy that's good. You have another candy that's not like, that doesn't make you double as happy. It's the same with, with bad feelings. If you have one death, that's bad. If you have two deaths, that's not double, that's not making you double as sad. And it might be even worse than that. Um, Paul Slovic, who did a lot of research into empathy, he did a study where he showed people a child. Like, take the child, for example. She has a miserable life, she's living in Syria, and you can help her, you can make a donation, and she will have a better life. Would you donate? I think lots of, lots of people of you would. Um, again, like, empathy is something we're really good at. But then I would tell you, okay, you can help that child, but you can't help her neighbor. Like, she's staying in Syria, she's like, she will have like a very uncertain future and all the nations will go to this first child, but not to the second one. And then I will tell you all the same thing about all these other children, that you can't help them. And 40%, 40% is the drop in donations that um, the researchers have seen towards that first child. People are less likely to help if they are reminded of all the people they can't help. We want to make a difference. It's called like a warm clothes theory. We want to feel good about helping. And we're feeling, we, we, yeah, we want to feel like we make a difference and we don't want to get reminded of all the difference we can't make. So maybe it's even like that, Paul Slovic suggests. Um, maybe actually we value one life even more than like 3,000 lives. 3,000 lives mean nothing to us, but one life we are really invested in. Like it's a huge difference for us if one child dies or not, but it doesn't really matter if 3,770 people die or 3,771. Sucks. <laughs> Emotions suck. It's like really, okay, it's, yeah, no, but uh, not articulate, and there is this weird ego wants to have impact thing going on. It makes me pretty angry. Um, how about we don't do feelings anymore? And just decide everything rationally. Um, rationality is good. Um, Paul Bloom is like a big opponent of empathy. He says, if you want to be good and do good, empathy is a poor guide. And it's not just because of that, because of empathy has this weird, we can't really value lives properly thing, but also because empathy is not fair. We tend to, um, we tend to help people and to have empathy towards people who look like us, who are looking cuter, who look more like they need help. That's not the same with, with rationality, of course. You would treat everybody the same. But then again, would we treat anybody, actually? Because wh why should I care, right? Like, why should I care when I don't care? Um, why should I care for some child in Syria that has maybe some very far away impact on the economy, but actually, you know, I don't care. 
Um, so maybe rationality is actually also <laughs> not the solution. I think, I think we need both. We need the numbers and the feelings. We need um, numbers and narrative, and anecdotes and abstraction. We need the slow system one if you were Kahneman and the fast system two. I think that's how it should be. We should make people care about the topic and then we should tell them what to do and how to do it in a very rational way. First, we want to show them that they should do something and we want them to decide to do something. And then we can show them in rational terms how to do it and what to do. And that's what I want to um, talk about in the rest of the talk. Um, so first, data visualization, what does it have to do with that? Um, well, most data visualization looks like that still. Um, it doesn't really do justice to the people it represents. These are about uh, malaria deaths and traffic fatalities and unemployed people. And it doesn't really, you know, make me care so much. It's like really more on a number scale. It really speaks to my analytical self. Um, and I think some of you might say, oh, that's actually good, right? Like data visualization is supposed to speak to the rational mind. And that's, I actually like that it doesn't try to manipulate me like these super manipulating emotional photos of um, kids um, at the shore. And I would say, okay, that, that's fair. It really depends on your goals in the end. I think data visualization is just a tool. Um, you can use it to represent data in a very, very objective way. But you can also, you should be able to do something like that that speaks more to your emotions. In the end, it's like language. Language can also be super um, objective and like super harsh and cold. Or you can have poems um, that make you really feel things. Data visualization is a tool. And if you want to evoke emotions with data visualization, I feel like you should be able to. We should build a toolkit to make that possible, um, even if most data visualization will still stay in the rationality term um, sphere. So that's the rest of my talk, how to make fields with data visualization. Uh, I have some ideas, but I'm also very happy to, to hear your ones. Um, first one, easy one, simple one, make use of colors. Um, we're all using colors anyway in data visualization. Um, this, for example, is a um, um, Syria tracker that uh, tracks the deaths of Syrian people. And it comes in a very comfortable, cozy, like very nice looking blue. I think that really is, is not what it's about in the end. I feel like, um, again, you would do justice more to the, what you represent if you would show it in a slightly different way. And that's the least you can do. In fact, like the three most intense, most emotional data visualizations of the past years um, make a great use, a very impactful, impactful use of colors. Um, the first one is about um, gun deaths in the US. The second one is about uh, victims of the Second World War, and the third is about, about um, deaths from drones. And they all have black as a background, and they all have these highlights with colors. And um, yeah, this is really one of the simple tools to, to create that empathy. Um, show what the data would mean for your experience. Um, that's an interesting one. Maybe imagine three layers. First, you have the numbers, just a table, just like black on white, like all your numbers. You don't really understand them well, and they don't have any meaning for you because you don't understand them. So that's why you add the visualization. That's what makes you understand the data. That's what shows you what's actually in the data and tells you the stories. But then you want the other layer, the experience layer, or like a meaning layer that tells you why you should care. That's why everybody's freaking out about VR, um, because VR does exactly that. It puts you into a situation. It makes you feel things in a situation because you're there, because you have the experience. Um, so yeah, experience makes you feel things. And I think that's something um, a lot of you have seen, and I want to show that again, because it's doing that really well, not putting you in a situation, but bringing the situation towards you. Let's see if that works. Make a wish. Yeah. Granny. Have you done your homework? Ready or not. Here it comes. Ireland clashes with British. Live ammunition again. Deserve to get shot. Have a nice day, Sam. Airstrikes on rebel position. We are going to 
This video had more like 55 million clicks um, or views until now. It's really impactful. It, again, it brings you, it doesn't bring you into the situation, it brings the situation to you. And that's one step further than visualizations like these ones. I think you've seen these ones before, where they ask you to enter your zip code or something, and then they tell you what the data looks like for you right now. But this is, these things are more like thought experiments, like the Berliner Morgen Post did that recently. Um, the US is pretty far away, you have Trump's wall there, whatever that means. They take the wall and put it in front of your door, basically. You can see what the door looks like or would look like if it would be actually there in your environment, in your experience that you have right now. Uh, something similar is doing uh, um, the BBC that with this news game, um, where they put people in the lives of Syrian refugees and let them make decisions. Um, so here, for example, you can decide to pay somebody the deposit or refuse to pay them the proper deposit. Um, again, that's bringing you into the situation. That was pretty advanced, but you can actually make something more simple and do some calculations. Uh, CNN was doing that, um, where they calculated what it would mean if 1 to 1.3 percent of a population would be killed, like it's the case right now in Syria. I mean, I don't think that so many Americans actually care about Syria, but if three to four million Americans would be killed in their own country, like, wow, <laughs> would be, would be Armageddon. Um, yeah, there are lots of questions you can ask to make these thought experiments, these parallel universes, and I would really like to see that more often done in 2017 in the data visualization scene. Um, another example, zoom into one dot. Um, Every project needs a story, as the Berliner Morgen Post guys would say. And that's exactly what they do. Like, they always have these data visualizations, beautiful at the top. Here, for example, one that shows where people who currently live in Berlin actually come from. But then they also go on the street and ask people and zoom into the one dot, into that one data point, and ask them and are like, um, where are you from? Why do you live here? Do you like it in Berlin? Etc. So that people can relate to somebody. Um, and that's an old journalistic trick, right? Um, that's from the NPR website. Um, most, especially feature stories, start with like an anecdote at the beginning. Here, for example, a photo of one person and then go up level and high level and show you the overview and show what the data means or like how many, how many people are actually have like similar stories because they share, they are the similar, in a similar data bin. Um, and of course, um, advocacy organizations are doing that a lot. Um, that's actually interesting um, because it actually states like, we can't lose sight of the individuals. It actually says exactly that. Don't just look at the numbers. Like you will never see something like that um, that will show you the data visualization of how many people died. They will always show you a photo, an individual. And that's one of my favorite Twitter bots. Um, as somebody who works with the American census a lot, I really like it. Um, it shows you one data point of the American census and tells you all the data it knows about the data point. And I think that's, that's, that's a great example of like how you have data about millions of people. It's like a statistics. If you have data about one person, it's a story. Show what you're talking about. Um, that's something that's also pretty old. Otto Neurath and his graphic designer Gerd Arns already did that in the 1930s, where they showed data about people with actual symbols of people. Um, and that's what the New York Times is still doing or has still done in the last years. Uh, and here the Washington Post. 
and show the mass as individuals, the last part. Um, it's similar to the zooming into dots thing, but it's more like you don't just zoom into one dot and show them as an example, but actually show like all the dots as like the whole data. Um, the alcoholics and anonymous are doing that, for example. They focus on a small step. They say, um, also, of course, being abstinent for the rest of their lives is the goal of the program. Alcoholics are told to stay sober one day at a time or one hour at a time. You focus on what's close. You focus on what's achievable. And um, you bring the data closer, as you do with this example, for example. 800,000 um, killed in the last 800 days versus one life lost every 11 seconds. The first number you can calculate with, and that's super important too, but the second number is what speaks to your heart, what speaks to your emotions. Parship is actually doing something um, similar with their, um, like Parship, the, the German okay Cupid, uh, <laughs> they're like, um, they advertise their service, their matchmaking service with saying um, a single thoughts and laugh every 11 minutes on their website. Um, whatever that means. Um, they don't say like 50,000 people per year fall in love on Parship. Um, they like focus on the individual because you're standing on a subway platform and you see that advertisement and you can actually, <laughs> you can actually imagine being that single or like that single, he was alone and then he found someone and he's happy. And then you can say, okay, every 11 minutes is actually a lot. Maybe I should sign up to be less lonely. Um, and that's um, uh, a data visualization I showed before um, from Periscopic about uh, US gun deaths, which does something super, super interesting and, and similar. So it's actually an animation, but I will show the slides um, to explain them. Um, what you can see is arcs being drawn for every person, but then they drop, like the dots drop at some point because they get killed um, by a gun, and then they keep drawing the arc to show you how long that the person would have lived. And they show one example, right? They explain the data visualization by showing one example. And then they show another example. And then another one. And then they show three at one point, et cetera. And it goes almost, it goes always faster and faster. And it accelerates a lot until you end at something like that. So you can still see the dots. And that's the point I want to make. It's not like this one data bar chunk that you have. You can still see and go into every dot if you want to. There's something similar um, said about uh, the Holocaust by the Holocaust survivor, Abel Herzberg. There were not six million Jews murdered, there were one murder six million times. And I urge you to do that the next time you see like a big number about people. Imagine that thing that is described about it, 300,000 people being actually happening to one person and then just multiply it. This is not quite six million, this is five million six hundred thousand. It's the last number the artist Roman Albarca, uh, Obarca, um, uh, painted. He painted every single number from one to exactly this number. Here you can see him doing that. And I always, I, I wonder if he actually is the person in this world who can judge big numbers the best, who can actually, who actually knows what a big number means because he spent time with every single number, right? If these were people, he would know what it means because it took him years, years to like write these down, but every number took only like half a minute or so to write down. Dear Data is a project that um, did something similar. Um, Stephanie Posavec and Georgia Lupi wrote each other postcards where they're true their data. So for example, this is a postcard from Georgia Lupi where she shows all the songs she listened to in, in one week. And it's not, it's not, generated by the 3JS or like R or something. She actually drew all these things. She spent time with every single data point. Now we're going from like the user side to the creator side. Like this is something you can do as a creator to understand big data better. And Georgia Lupi was writing about that. Um, she was, she called something like that data humanism. And she said exactly that. Um, instead of saving time with data, spend time with data. And instead of data as numbers, data as people. So yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, let me sum that up. Um, why feelings are good and why we don't have them. I argued that, that feelings are like pretty bad for like big numbers, but that, that we still need them to make us actually care. Um, 
we can do that with data visualization. We don't have to. We can do it, though. And I think we should um, think about how we can achieve that. And then I was talking about all the options, how to make feelings with data visualization. For example, making use of colors, zooming into one dot, showing what you're talking about with people symbols, showing what the data would mean for your experience, and showing the mass as individuals. Um, so yeah, thank you. Oh no, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> These were three important points. I think a fourth one is missing here, which is also super important. Um, once you made the feelings, you need to do something with it. You can't just leave people with their feelings. You have some responsibility if you create feelings on people because they get helpless as heck when they don't know what to do with it. If you're angry, you need to punch something. And if you're, if you're sad, you need to cry. And if you have empathy for something, you may need to make a donation or something to not feel like the world is burning if you don't do anything. That's not something I will talk about today, but keep it in mind. Your responsibility is somebody who makes people feel. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks. That was awesome. So one quick announcement before we take questions. We're going to clear the room after the FAQ is over. That means everybody who is in will go out and use both doors. Ja, wir werden den Saal räumen, nachdem FAQ fertig ist, oder die FAQ Q&A, was auch immer, fertig ist. Alle Leute werden rausgehen, bitte beide Ausgänge benutzen und damit neue Leute, rein, neue Leute rein können für den nächsten Vortrag, die dann schon gespannt drauf warten. So, haben wir noch Fragen? Kannst du kurz an die Mikrofon nach kommen? Hi Lisa, thank you for your talk, I'm Maya. Um, you, you very briefly mentioned VR and the possibilities for empathy in VR, and I think I kind of um, don't really see it that way, so I'm curious about how you see it, and if you could say more about that, thank you. I'm not a VR expert, but I would love to know why you don't see it that way. <laughs> I'll tell you after you tell me. I mean, I, I can... <laughs> uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to talk about it, but I'm, I'm just sort of interested in how you're seeing, um, if, if you think of a continuum of different kinds of visual techniques that we have to generate empathy and feelings with, uh, with different kinds of data points, mm -hmm. then data viz is one and, and VR is another that's been kind of talked about a lot. Um, I think people like Sam Gregory sort of discuss what's sort of problematic with this um, in that it just kind of makes, it, it says that it's going to immerse you in an experience, but what it does is it just puts you into that experience and then drops you. It doesn't actually take you anywhere with it. And just you having the experience is the most important part of VR. Um, I mean, there are some which are slightly different, more interesting, um, and I, I, I can think of some examples, but I'm kind of curious to think, uh, to, to hear about what you would feel about VR. And as somebody who works with data and numbers, like, what does that seem like on the horizon? That's super interesting. Thank you for your point. Um, again, I'm not a VR expert. Um, I've, I've done it once. I was blown away like a pretty good with a yeah. Um, I think there's some reason that so many newsrooms like the New York Times invest in VR so much. Um, yeah, of course, it's like shiny and fancy and new, and that's why they love it too. Um, but I think there's something, maybe just to the newness, you know, if you're like, I can, I can still remember the first VR experience I had. And if this first VR experience would have been about Syria or something, I would have, like, I would have still remembered that because it's something we don't see um, every day. Um, I wonder now, like I really liked your point about um, how people get dropped into a situation and then it's like that's it and they can always escape. I wonder if that's actually the opposite of beneficial, <laughs> like if it actually hurts because um, yeah, because you don't you don't live there. Like you have to experience it. You can always escape. This is. I wonder. I'm not sure. Um, but thank you. <laughs> okay, so we can do one more question, maybe two if they're quick. I'm. I'll, I'll go out, but I'm sure Lisa will take some time outside as well for more discussion. 
Um, hi, thank you for your talk. Hi. I was wondering um, if you would be giving this talk in front of a whole bunch of right-wing horrible people, would you give the same talk? Right-wing horrible people? Like how horrible? <laughs> <laughs> He said six of ten horribles. <laughs> I don't really believe in horrible people. Um, but um, I, th I think I would need to go through the slides again, but actually it feels like there's nothing that should offend them too much. <laughs> I, I, will, I will let you know, though, the next time I will give that talk in front of like, lots of horrible right-wing people, and then we, you know, we can have a discussion about what I should leave out or something to not get hurt. 30 right. seconds. Okay. Um, uh, thank you for a really inspiring talk. Um, most of the great visualizations I've seen were designed as a very personal experience for one single person to experience or observe at once. And I'm curious if you have thoughts about visualizations that are designed uh, to connect people or to be experienced by more than one person. Oh, wow. Okay, I've never thought about that at all. This is super interesting. You mean like um, visualizations that are supposed to be seen or like experienced by lots of people. I, I mean, I've definitely seen data visualizations in museums, and I think this is the closest one I can think of, um, like 3D visualizations um, or visualizations you need to build together, I guess. Um. <laughs> let's talk more after. Can you guys continue outside? We will. Uh, let's, let's talk about it afterwards. It's super interesting. Thank Perfect. you. I'm sure there'll be a great conversation outside.